Well, it is good to be with you this morning, the day after Christmas. Actually, fun fact, I'm actually preaching this, recording this a few days before Christmas. So um, Christmas for my end is still coming up, but by the time you're seeing this, your Christmas day is already complete. And I hope you had a great day and I hope it's still, it's still happening and you're enjoying the holiday season. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us and it's good to be with you. And to start out with, I want to just take a moment to just have you reflect on the, really it's a reality in life, and those times where things are just not always as they seem. For example, you know, Amazon, you see something on there, and you like the price, and you, you click on, and it shows up the next day, you open up the package, and it's just not exactly what you, you see. I, I remember when, do you, do you remember when the pandemic first started? And some were wearing masks before they had to. You think, wow, that seems pretty extreme. Like, who wears a mask, right? And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, things keep changing. Then everyone has to wear a mask. And all of a sudden, there was this frantic thing for masks. And I remember Elder finding these masks on, on Amazon. And, and they looked fine. He ordered them. And it was just like they were like super small. Like they're for like kids. And they were good about it and gave us our money back. But sometimes things are just not as they seem. Maybe it's not just a product. Maybe it's a dream vacation. You see the brochure and say, oh, you know, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to go. And then you, if you follow it, you, you take that vacation and maybe it just wasn't what you thought it was going to be. Maybe it's about a person. Have you ever met someone and they seem so pleasant, they seem so gifted, and then you get to know them for a while and you think, Wow, that was odd. That was kind of weird. I didn't, didn't expect that to happen. You know, especially in a ministry context, I could tell you a few stories about that. But you see, when we find something or someone and these things are just not as they seem, sometimes that happens because it's just a, a lack of clarity, right? We just didn't fully understand or didn't see all the information. Sometimes it's someone intentionally trying to deceive us or, or lie us. And sometimes we've got the wrong information or we misunderstood the information. But with all that in mind, that things are not always as they seem, that's what as much of this message is about today. You know, this is our last Christmas message in this series. And today we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Matthew. And we tend to gravitate a lot of times to Matthew, don't we? Because it does recount so well many elements of the Christmas story. And fun fact, I love preaching from the, the very the tippy top of Matthew. You see this, li this list of names, this genealogy of Jesus. And I love when I get to preach from that. But I've already done it a couple times since I've been here, so I can't really do that now. And, but I, I enjoy studying it. And if you find, what you, what you find, and if you look at that lineage, oh, there's liars, there's adulterers, there's murderers, even those involved in this incestuous relationship, which really speaks to the chronic problem of the Jewish people that Matthew is writing to. You see, they seem to have this underlying belief that, you know, hey, God chose us all because we're so special. In other words, they believe that they, they cho God chose them because of their merit. Oh, but they couldn't have been more wrong. So in Matthew, when he starts off this gospel and he's reminding the Jewish people of their less than stellar background, the reality of the situation is that the Jewish people, they were God's chosen people, yes. But they were given that, they were chosen as a gift. It was all about grace. It was something that they didn't deserve. And so even though it's not a study of the genealogy in depth uh, today, I, I simply want to point out that you know, right as the book of Matthew begins, there is this vibe that's going on that, that things are not as they appear. For the Jews, you get a glimpse of these people and you look at the lineage of Jesus and, and you, you, you begin to dig a little bit and you see, oh, their religious life is not what it appeared. You know, some may have concluded, but, oh, you know, these guys are going through the motions. They seem like godly people. And, and yeah, they had religion. Yeah, they had a knowledge of God. But that is very different than having a vibrant relationship with the God that made them. So, in terms of the Jewish relationship with God, my point is, things were not as they seemed. And so today, we're going to kind of keep going with that. We're going to keep moving on that thought and ask, we really want to be asking a similar question of ourselves. You know, you might be, and, and I might be, we might be doing life and we think, yeah, God's giving us thumbs up, but really the reality is we've just deceived ourselves. 
and we're simply doing life the way that we want to do. And we've tried to build a God to suit our own desires. So my hope and my prayer is that this Christmas season that God will speak to you and prompt all of us to take an honest look at our lives, recognizing that things are not always as they appear. Well, let me uh, just read the text. If you've got your Bibles or your phones, uh, we're going to be reading. It's pretty familiar to many of you. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel, the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's just pray together as we begin. Heavenly Father, we just pray, Lord, that you would search us. Lord, that you would help, Lord, reveal any areas of deceit in our lives. Lord, that uh, we would see, Lord, just the, the, a fresh picture, a true picture of who your Son is. Lord, help me to speak clearly, and if there's someone here that is listening that has not embraced you as our Lord and Savior, I pray that today would be that day, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, the first area of confusion that, we, that the text deals with that we're looking at today, it, it involves Mary, right? When Joseph records for us, the, or sorry, when Matthew records the Christmas story, he records that Mary and Joseph were betrothed with each other. Look at verse 18 again. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. You know, remember, I don't know if you saw last week's broadcast, but anyway, we talked a little bit about that, that betrothal period. And it's sort of like our engagement that we have today, but not really. It was much more intense, much more binding. It was, I would say it was more like marriage. Legally, it was as if they were husband and wife, but there'd be no physical union between them. In fact, the union was so binding, if you wanted to break the betrothal, you had to get a divorce. And, and it's this right to divorce that we see that Joseph, he's, he's about to exercise that right. Right? Look at the later part of verse 18 and 19. Before they came uh, together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. For her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Think of the disappointment. Like, just put yourself in, in Joseph's shoes for a minute. He hears this news about Mary's pregnancy. And, and we understand that he was a just man. I, I believe he loved God. He was obeying God. He feared God. He had followed God's ways. And, and now Joseph gets this news. His future wife is pregnant. Like, what's up with that? But it's interesting, you know, that Joseph is hurt and confused. As he was. He didn't seek revenge, Right? You know, he, he didn't get bitter towards God. He didn't try to seek his pound of flesh. Legally, when he found out that Mary was pregnant, he could have put the wheels in motion to have her stoned to death. Because you need to understand at that time, a public execution like that was the legal punishment for adultery. But Joseph, you know, he quickly found out that things were not as they seemed. And I understand also with Joseph, it's not as if he was thinking or acting unbiblically yet he clearly didn't see what, everything that was going on. So imagine the hurt, imagine the confusion when he thought about these things, and then verse 20, an angel shows up and clears things up. But as he considered these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. An angel appears, right? The angel says, hey, Joseph, God is orchestrating all, this whole thing. 
He, he tells Joseph about the miracle that has happened, that his betrothed wife is, is conceived from the Holy Spirit. And now that sounds really strange to us, right? If we've never heard this before, it's just like, wow, like, what's up with that? But the Jew who knew the Old Testament, like Joseph would have, this wouldn't have been that hard to understand because this was something that had been talked about hundreds of years before it happened. You know, hundreds of years before this happened, Isaiah spoke in Isaiah 7, 14. He said, you know what? The Messiah is going to be born of a virgin. And, and that's why the angel makes reference to this when he re he's revealing God's plan to Joseph. Verse 21, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save, uh, for he will save his people from their sins. That is an important line. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Okay, so Joseph's given this explanation about Mary's pregnancy, but he's also given instruction, right? Take Mary as your wife, and this is what you're going to call the baby. And he does all of that. So the first misconception that we see in the text it's about the pregnancy of Mary. And, and it appeared to Joseph, with the information that he had at the time, it appeared, oh, oh no, Mary has been immor immoral, which simply was not true. The truth was that her pregnancy was a result of the Holy Spirit coming upon her. The next misconception is regarding who the baby is. Right? In chapter 2 of Matthew, uh, chapter 2 of Matthew, which we'll get to, it, now, it, we see that there has been some time after the birth of Jesus that all of a sudden these wise men appear, right? They, they're here to worship the baby. So look at Matthew chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has, who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it, when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Okay, so we've got these wise men, or, or magi. Know that they're not called kings, and we don't actually know how many they were, right? We, there was three gifts, so we said, oh, there must be three guys. But the Bible actually doesn't tell us. We know that when Herod, uh, the king, if you... If you kind of keep following the, the text, when Herod finds out about this newborn king, he's not happy at all, right? And he sets out to kill the baby. But consider this. Herod's murderous response to try to thwart the plan of God indicates that he perceived that at this point, he believed that Jesus was a helpless baby. And likely others as well would have believed that this baby, well, you know what, this is just like any other baby. But things, again... Our tagline, things are not as they seem, because Jesus is no other ordinary baby. You know, back in chapter 1, just to make sure Joseph understood that this baby was no ordinary baby, do you remember what we read? You should call his name Jesus. Well, just FYI, what that name means, it means Jehovah is salvation. That means Jesus is going to save his people. You know, Joseph is probably very familiar with you know, great deliverers of the Old Testament times, and, and maybe that's where Joseph originally thought this was going to go, right? But the angel clarifies, oh, no, no, the great work that Jesus is going to do, for he will save his people for their sins. Oh, we can't pass by that statement, right? And to help us to see the significance of what Jesus is going to do, I, I want to just take a moment to just look at what sin is and the impact of it, because it is a big deal. Because sin is actually a violation of God's standards. In other words, sin is something that we do that violates God's standard, or it could even be something that we should be doing, but we're not doing it. Have you ever lied before? No? Yeah, you know, you'll join the club. You, like me, you are a sinner. Have you ever stolen anything? Dishonored your parents? Look lustfully at someone other than your spouse? Lost your temper, taking the Lord's name in vain. Well, you know, welcome to the group of sinners. You know, John wrote in, in chapter 3 of 1 John, he wrote this, which I think sums up sin pretty good. Whoever commits sin, yep, that's me, um, also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So, okay, just understand that it is a violation of God's standards, and that's important. 
We're not talking about violating my standards or yours, right? It, it, we're, this is God's standards. And we are talking also about the guilt and the punishment that that, that sin brings, where it leads to, because our sin is against God. Let me use stealing, for example. Let's say, you know, I, I steal something of yours. And then it's just like, ah, oh, why did I do that? I feel really bad. I shouldn't have done that. And, and I said, you know what? I'm going to try and make this right. So I go to your neighbor's house. I knock on the door and I say, hey, can, can you forgive me for stealing your, your neighbor's whatever it is? Well, they can't do that. It didn't involve them. I, I didn't violate them. I violated you. So guess what? When we sin against God, guess whose forgiveness we need? We need God. We need God's forgiveness. And so back to this declaration from this angel in Matthew 1, the angel is declaring that Jesus is able to forgive the sin of mankind. Think of that. Jesus will be able to forgive sins committed against God. And the only way that, that Jesus will be able to do that is if he himself is God. And that's who he is. He is God in the flesh. So my point is simply this. This baby that Joseph is being told about in Matthew 1, he's no ordinary baby. This baby is also God. So when Jesus would be born, yeah, it, it appears that he's some helpless baby. And by looking at what Herod does and how he responds, I think it's safe to say that he believed that Jesus was helpless. He thought, you know what, I am going to be able to destroy this baby. But he couldn't do that, right? We know. He couldn't do any harm to the baby because he was actually fighting against God. So Joseph thought Mary was pregnant because of immorality. Not true, right? Herod thought that Jesus was just any old Ordinary baby, also not true. And now we come to the third misconception. And to describe the third misconception, we actually get to go back to the genealogy in chapter 1. So I'm going, yeah, because I love that. But as, as I mentioned, I mentioned that because it, it paints a very clear picture for us to see. And, and it's that these individuals listed in this genealogy, they've got a problem. Notice that the genealogy started with Abraham. Who's he? Well, he is the father of the Jewish nation. Well, a few fun facts about Abraham is that he had this habit of lying when he got into a jam, right? Tough situation comes, oh, I need to lie to get out of it because he wondered if God would preserve him. He had a nephew that got so drunk, he didn't know that his daughters tricked him into having sex with him. We see also on the list the leader of a tribe of God's chosen people, Judah, important guy. Well, he slept with his daughter-in-law because he thought she was a prostitute. And then there was God's chosen king, David. Love David. But the reality is he murdered a man to cover up an affair that he had had. And another interesting point to consider is just some Bible history. Did you know that between the last book of the Old Testament and when these Gospels start, there was 400 which are referred to as silent years. Right, so you would think, okay, think from the Jewish perspective, the people living at the time of Jesus, you, you think you'd find a nation that was hungry for God. It, it should have been obvious to them that, oh, you know what, we've got a sin problem. This sin is separating us from having fellowship with God. Oh, the, 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 that Redeemer, that Savior that the prophets talked about, oh, we need Him. And so you think Jesus now coming on the scene, you think that the people would be embracing him by the masses. Yet, if you examine Luke's record of Jesus' birth, you're kind of surprised by what you see, right? Because you see that when Jesus is born, you know, there's these shepherds there, there's this poor young couple, Mary and Joseph, Joseph, and they're the ones celebrating the birth of Jesus. You, you don't see any Jewish leaders Right? No one's coming to pay homage to this newborn king. But what you do see is these non-Jewish, Gentile, wise men coming from far away to worship him. You see, the misconception that I am talking about you know, is for the most part that the Jewish people, even though they believed in God, there was this misconception, and I think this is a very frightening one. And this misconception was that they didn't understand, they didn't truly understand, didn't truly understand their need for God. Does that describe you? 
you know, they didn't recognize that their sin was a barrier between them and a holy and just God. They, they failed to realize that they would be judged by God's standards and, and not theirs. For Joseph's misconception, of, well, first, well, he didn't see God's hand in Mary's pregnancy, but that soon changed, right? Herod's misconception was, well, that was a totally pagan perspective. I don't think God was even on his radar. But I say that this one is a scary one because this is from religious people who thought they were right with God. But the reality was they had this incredible need for a Savior and they didn't even realize that there was a need. Wow, what a scary place to be in need of God and God so close that they just let the opportunity drift by. For many, at the birth of Jesus, God seemed so far away. You know, as a nation, they had endured a lot. They really had. They endured slavery and bondage. And as I had mentioned before, God had not spoken to them for 400 years. I, I'm sure some of them, many of them, if not most of them, wonder, where is God in all of this? You know, how, how much can God really be in control? With, our will is not making sense to us. Like, what's up with this Roman government that's in charge of God's people? The reality was God was not far away. In fact, God is so close, we're told that Jesus is also Emmanuel. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. That was verse 22. Verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know, Matthew makes sure that we understand the meaning of the name. Hey, just in case you don't understand what it means, it means God is with us. But do we realize what that means? It, it means for you and I, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, in all of life's circumstances, God is with you. Possibly this Christmas, you are grieving a tremendous loss from this past year, as, 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 as I am and, and our, my family is. Or maybe you're grieving a loss from other years. Oh, maybe you're, you're wondering, oh, I can't believe this, this pandemic. It's like another wave is coming. When's this going to end? But whatever loss we have endured in the past, or whatever loss we may endure in the future, understand that Jesus is with us. And understand this, Jesus is enough. You know, all throughout the New Testament, we learn other descriptions of Emmanuel. We learn that he is the bread of life. That means he's our one essential food. Oh, we learn that he is our cornerstone. He is our sure foundation for life. Oh, we, we find out that he is our protector. He is our sustainer. He is our guide because he's also our chief shepherd. He is our provider and caretaker. Oh, because he's also the good shepherd. Emmanuel is our hope in the midst of darkness because he is also the light of the world. He is with us. He is Emmanuel. Well, I wonder if any of these misconceptions that we've talked about kind of ring with you, that you can relate to them. You know, maybe you're like Joseph and you're, you're not living in sin, right? It, but you're also, you're not seeing what God is doing in your current situation. It's just not making sense to you. Or maybe you're like Herod. And you know what? God is not even on your radar. You have totally misunderstood who God is, and you think you, should, you can dictate to God how He should rule. And, and you firmly believe that God will answer to you. Or possibly you're here, and, and you, don't, you believe in God, but you don't feel God to be very near. Let me just say, as I kind of wrap this up, is that all of this really comes down to what we truly believe about Jesus. It does. Because what we believe about Jesus not only determines our eternal destiny, whether we're going to heaven or hell, right? What we believe about Jesus also determines how we are going to live right now. Paul Tripp recently wrote in a blog that he says, when you look into that manger in Bethlehem, you need to see a warrior. On Christmas Day, Celebrate the birth of the great warrior. And he goes on. He says, he won the victory that you and I could never won, have won. 
Jesus came to battle with the enemy and defeated him for our sake. He succeeded against the devil in his life. He overcame him on the cross and he conquered him with the empty tomb. Oh, what great words. You see, Paul Tripp understood the reality of who this baby is. So this Christmas, don't misunderstand the reality of the truth that we find in the Christmas story. God is with us despite our failures and our doubts. God is near us and he wants you to trust him with your life. You know, Mary and Joseph, they trusted, they obeyed, and I think it's safe to say they were very blessed, for sure. The Magi followed and worshipped. I think we could say the same. They were blessed. Herod, different story, right? He rebelled against God's redemptive plan, and he died in his sin. And so the question I have for you, friend, is who is Jesus to you? What will you do with this baby Jesus? Because everything hinges on that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that we can have in him. We thank you, Lord, for your children. You promised to protect us, sustain us, and guide us. There is not any situation, any dark situation that your light can't shine in it. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that whatever we find ourselves in, you are Emmanuel, you are God with us. And I just pray, Lord, that we would just, by your grace, grow in our love and our understanding of who you are. And again, as I prayed at the beginning of the broadcast, Lord, if there is someone listening that has not responded to this wonderful gift that you offer, I pray that they would bow the knee to you today and come to you, Lord, and acknowledge you as their Lord and Savior and ask for forgiveness for their sins. Oh, Lord, we are all sinners None of us are worthy of your grace, but we thank you that you show it upon those who trust in your name. We ask, we ask these things, and, and Lord, we just thank you so much. We pray your blessing. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, once again, thank you uh, for joining us. I hope you have a great rest of the, the holiday week, and look forward to being with you next time. Take care.